for these uh, issues. Being our public advocate, <laughs> it's, it's, it is a wonderful thing to, that we can build and grow this crowd year to year. And we hope um, month to month and day to day that he continues to publicly advocate for us. <laughs> but because this is a nonpartisan event, we're just talking about how wonderful he is as our public advocate. <laughs> I was going to go for a run. The unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. And now, something you've all heard for many, many years, we hold these truths, and if you remember this, please join in. <laughs> we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, <laughs> That's an addition. <laughs> an amendment. Deriving, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Of the governed. That, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to demolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. And maybe when the speakers come, we can all the speakers stand over here so uh, we can be heard and people can come closer. Uh, we already caught the first problem with the document, <laughs> the sexism within the document. Uh, but this group understands men means men and women. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's still a struggle that is ongoing, as we saw recently in the Democratic primaries on the national level, uh, the amount of sexism that still exists around the country in the year 2008. So, uh, 27 paragraphs setting forth grievances. We're not going to read every one of those paragraphs. I've carved out about a half a dozen of them that I think are relevant today. So who would like to begin? Okay. Uh, oh, okay. You need to, you can hear. Me, you can hear. Can you hear me now? Woo! But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to... I'm talking here! <laughs> they will do anything to silence us, but we will not let them, right? Right! <laughs> but when a long train of abuses and user patients, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. King, King's name, of course, was George. I don't know why that comes to mind. 
He has refused his assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly and womanly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. The U.S. Patriot Act allows the government now to do what's called sneak and peek. While we're out here reading this document, hypothetically, the government could be sneaking and peeking and doesn't have to let you know until 60 and possibly 120 days thereafter. A radical change post 9-11. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislature for quartering large bodies of armed troops upon, among us, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Okay. All right. We're, we're now going to, we'll get to that section of the Constitution, which is more and more relevant these days. Uh, and we're going to need someone to finish off some wonderful language in the Declaration of Independence. But before we get there, what was just read talks about conceptually the tyranny, the despot. And this document, which is the founding document for our nation, it says that there are inalienable rights, and when the time comes that the tyranny, the despot, is of such a nature that the people cannot take it anymore, it gives us the right to declare our independence from that despot, from that tyranny. So this, many Americans forget that that was the beginning, the roots, the origin of our nation, and so when people advocate change, when people engage in peaceful, nonviolent civil disobedience, I mean, you can cite the Declaration of Independence as a defense. Anyway, who is going to finish off the last part of the Declaration? Okay, introduce yourself. My name is Jim McCabe. Okay, Jim, thank Jim, you. Where Just start right over here. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Thank you, John. A group called the Bill of Rights Defense Committee from Northampton. I know Bernadette's one of the signatories. I was saying that yesterday, the Bill of Rights Defense Committee from Northampton, Massachusetts, created a 2008 <coughs> Declaration of Independence. 
when in the course of human events the government becomes destructive of the ends for which it was established, it is the right of the people to alter it and demand restoration of those constitutional principles that have so long restored their liberty, safety, and happiness. Therefore, on the anniversary of independence, we offer this new declaration for our times. And it lists about a dozen grievances no, I, I don't against know. I don't know. Uh, Bush and the Bush administration. And so I'm always happy when people are going back to the original documents and making them applicable to the year 2008. So now that we've done the Declaration of Independence, we're going to move on to the Constitution. And the background. Don't have to. They're already rewriting the Constitution. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> the Constitution starting, there was a constitutional convention, May 25th in 1787, and there were representatives from the original 13 colonies. They met during the summer of 1787, and on September 17th, 1787, 38 signers signed the Constitution of the United States. There are seven articles in the Constitution of the United States. The first three are setting forth the framework of our government. The first one is the legislature. The second one is the executive branch of government. And the third, hi Bill, and third, the judiciary. Uh, we're going to go through each one of them, pointing out certain aspects of it. And we get to certain parts in the Constitution, uh, there will be parts, for example, when we talk about habeas corpus, when we talk about impeachment, that there are people in the crowd who are involved in those movements. And you should feel free. We encourage you to then kind of raise your hand or just come up front and, in effect, have an open mic to kind of talk about those provisions. The premise, again, is that the Constitution is a living document, and it's we, the people, who have to make it uh, alive. When we talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, when we talk about the Bloomberg administration and the cuts last week of $6 million to the HIV AIDS community, which we will go through, my point is that those cuts take away the lives of many of our fellow New Yorkers who are HIV AIDS at this point. Similarly, when we talk about life and the federal government yesterday fires uh, Dr. Howard uh, from uh, the uh, National Institute of Safety and Occupation, uh, NICOSH, uh, because he's been supporting the 9-11 workers. Uh, that means that we are giving a death wish to the people who helped us on 9-11-01. So each year when I read these documents, provisions that I glanced over in the past become alive because of current events. And so part of what we do here today is not just read the words from 232 years ago or 221 years ago. We want to read those words and make it relevant today. The Constitution in the beginning, we the people, the preamble, I think is a glorious preamble. Again, the question of whether or not we have fulfilled what the preamble commits us to is a serious and substantial question. So I would like someone to be willing to come up and read the preamble. Okay, come on up. Yes, at, at our age, we all need those glasses. <laughs> okay. Just introduce yourself. With borrowed glasses, yes. With borrowed glasses. Can you hear me? No. 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 <laughs> I can hold it. Okay. How about now? All right. How about now? There you go. Good. Who are you? I'm Betsy Goldberg. I'm an Upper West Sider. I'm an artist and a former teacher of same in this system. <laughs> but that's another story. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's no, a record. Concrete, I it. was wondering. <laughs> Can you hold it too? That in person. It's already clipped there up the other end. No, I need a hand go. to hold the book. Oh, I got you. Here Only go. two hands. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, 
provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Keep going. Article 1, Section 1. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. Section 2. The House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen every second year by the people of the several states, and the electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Woo. Okay. We now have Senator Bill Perkins, who was here last year with us. carries forward on a day-to-day -day basis the principles and values that we're talking about here. And it is an honor and a privilege to introduce Bill Perkins. And, and it's uh, equally and greater an honor and a privilege to be here once again with you. Uh, representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years and excluding Indians not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons. Why don't we talk about that part? Now? You know who those three-fifths were? <laughs> <laughs> One is about to become the next president of the United States. Maybe. <laughs> so things have changed. The Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state, chosen by the legislature thereof for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. The Vice President of the United States shall be President of the Senate, but shall have no vote unless they be equally divided. The Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments. When sitting for that purpose, they shall be on oath or affirmation. When the President of the United States is tried, the Chief Justice shall preside, and no person shall be convicted without the concurrence of two-thirds of the members present. Judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor. All right, we got someone who wants to do Section 8. Section Hilda. 8? Hilda. But I want to go Hilda. actually first to the uh, Second Amendment. I have to know the we'll get to All that. right, so then okay. keep reading. Okay. The Congress shall have power to declare war. <laughs> the Congress shall have power to declare war. Let me, let me just put on that. Let me just point out on that provision. Since World War II, the Congress has never, never carry out its responsibility under Section 8, Article 1 of the Constitution. And the most glaring, the most horrific example of that is the current combat in Iraq. The Congress has been delinquent in not fulfilling its congressional responsibility based on what Bill just read. If we are at war, and we hear that all the time, why hasn't the Congress used the Constitution? And when people question whether or not Congress has the power to stop what's happening in Iraq, you just heard it from Bill, that they have the power to declare war. I read the papers every day. I listen to TV and radio. Unless I missed it, I haven't heard that Congress declared war. So from my perspective, this war in Iraq under Article 1, Section 8 is unconstitutional. Not only unconstitutional, you didn't hear it from me, you heard it from the founders of the nation. It is resoundingly 
being heard every year that we're out here and every day that the numbers go up of those who are injured and killed, not only on our side, but on the other side, how outrageous and outlandish and illegal this war is. And so for the grannies who have stood strong for years and years in opposition to the war, we want to commend you for the leadership that you have provided. Those of us and, 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 and those who have uh, joined you, uh, you also ought to be commended because this has been a, a very, very significant uh, violation of our Constitution. In fact, it is a very slippery slope because from here you can go anywhere. If you can have a war without declaring it, if you can violate the Constitution so blatantly, that's why we have torture that goes without being challenged, that goes on and which is denied even as the evidence pours forth daily about these types of things. So the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. And, and on that part, the Supreme Court of the United States just recently in a 5-4 decision, and I keep pointing about 5-4, because you basically on the Supreme Court right now have four conservatives, Roberts, Alito, Scalia, and Thomas. You've got, by and large, four liberals, which is Breyer, Stevens, Souter, and Ginsburg, Ruth Ginsburg from New York. Anthony Kennedy from San Francisco is very often the swing vote. And it's the Kennedy court, in effect. And on, for the third time, on the issue of Guantanamo, with what I believe historians will eventually write is one of the dark days of American history, what we have done there, the Supreme Court for a third time, a few weeks ago, said to the Bush administration, you cannot, you cannot suspend habeas corpus. And Kennedy wrote a very good, can you hold this one second? I just want to, hear this part. I want to read the language by Justice Kennedy. Quote, the laws and constitution are designed to survive and remain in force in extraordinary times. So the decision, Blue Meeting versus Bush about Guantanamo says that the people in Guantanamo that we have detained have a right of habeas corpus to come into the federal court to question the constitutionality and legality of their detention. That is a major, major decision. Also, there was a second case that didn't get a lot of coverage where there were two American citizens who were detained in Iraq, and they were detained for a period of time and they wanted to file a habeas corpus action, and the Bush administration said, because it was in Iraq, the Constitution did not apply to them. The Supreme Court in this one, nine to zero, nine to zero, said that the Bush administration was incorrect in interpreting the provision in habeas corpus. And so those two cases are important because it says that even in the year 2008, even with a Bush administration, the Supreme Court of the United States is not allowing habeas corpus to be eroded. Very important. Okay, let's continue, Bill. Okay. No. Pro no. There we go. <laughs> All right. This is the Arnold, the Arnold the Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah. provision. <laughs> No person except a national born citizen or a citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of this constitution shall be eligible to the office of president. Neither shall any person be eligible to that office who shall not have attained to the age of 35 years and been 14 years a resident within the United States. So since you're under 35, you can't be president. Oh, well, <laughs> in 2016. <laughs> 2016. All right. Let's see. We got, I think, one more. Oh, yeah. This is the Bill Clinton section. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> the Bill Clinton section. What's the silly voice that you'll say? I know, I know, but I'm trying to. Let's see. He shall have power to grant reprieves 
and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. Sounds familiar. <laughs> okay, and the last provision of, wait, wait, I jumped. Did we go, we, we jumped into article two, bills done one and two. No, I'd like to go to article two. This is it, yeah. Okay. The president, vice president, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. Now, I see some patriots out there with signs that say, arrest Bush. Yes. And let me say, before we move forward, that all of the patriots in the house, please give a shout out to end the war. Everybody, end the war. End the war now. End the war now. Thank you. Okay, there's a, a couple of people here, here Bernadette and Andrew, who are going to talk about the impeachment issue. There's a controversy that goes around. Some people are saying, well, I'm not sure there are grounds for impeachment. And even if there are grounds for impeachment, it, as a practical matter, can't be done. And let me tell you historically, even if George Bush finishes his term and he steps out of office, in January of 2009. There is historical precedent. In 1868, one of the, uh, it was the Secretary of War, if I remember, he had, I think it's Stanton, who had left office and he was impeached. When we impeached Richard, well, when we impeached Richard Nixon in the 70s, even after he resigned in August of 74, we continued to try to impeach him I remember going in November of 74 to meet with Peter Rodino in order to try to persuade the Congress to go ahead with impeachment because impeachment is for historical purposes. You want to be able to put the truth on the record, not just for us, but for our children, their children, and their children. And revisionism very simply takes over. And so what were the truths? in 2002, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, in 2058, might not be as clear cut. And that's another reason why impeachment is necessary, as Bill just said, for the record. So Bernadette and Adam, if you want to come, uh, Andrew. <laughs> Adam and Heath. Thank you. But short. How do I do this? Just push the button? Yeah. Let me get on your other side, Bernadette. Yeah, we gotta get this in front of them. Hi, I wasn't planning to speak, but Close to the mouth. a lot of uh, members of the 8th Congressional District and the country you felt- be right up against your mouth. Felt we wanted to put impeachment back on the table. Our representatives were not listening to any of us. We met, we talked, we wrote. Uh, we finally decided we needed to uh, demonstrate to Congressman Nadler and our district by running somebody on the impeachment issue. So, oh, okay. Well, it's nonpartisan, but we feel that uh, impeachment has to be back on the table. Is that okay to protect the Constitution? That's all I was. Even in the ACD. Think, think, rock star. Mike, right up here. I got it. Hang on, it. Go closer. I would like to hear from how many of you right now, give, me, give a yell if you think that there's time left for impeachment. If I ask that same question on Capitol Hill, you won't get that kind of response. My name is Adam Sullivan. Without going into the whys and wherefores, I'm just going to tell you that I'm here today to ask you if you get a chance. Your congressman is responsible to you. Give your congressman your word. Tell them what you want. If you want impeachment, you have to ask them. This constitution that we're reading today tells us all that our representative in the House is our personal and direct representative to the federal government. It's not the president. It's not even really your senator. But in the House, they have to answer to you. They are directly responsible to you. So if you think impeachment is a worthy thing, six months is plenty of time, let them know. I really think, uh, first of all, I would also like to thank that 
Norman Siegel and the grannies put together this event. This is a great event. The Constitution is a great document, and it is a living document, and it is worthy of our protection. And there is time to put it back together. There is time to mend it. And I want to thank you all for coming out here today. Thank you, Norman. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We've got to move on. Who's going to do Article 3 for us? Okay, over here. Ah. And then I got four, five, and six, and seven. So please come up here so we can move. And then we're going to get to the amendments. And Billy, Reverend Billy is going to sing the First Amendment. Well, I don't you one mic on you. Article three. Oh, hello, hello, everyone. My name is Patricia McHugh. Right into the. Hello, I'm. Hello, everyone. Happy Fourth of July. My name is Patricia McHugh. I am a vigiler with grandmothers against the war, and I am a lover of peace and a public librarian. Article 3, Section 1. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. The next yellow. Switch the next Just keep yellow. reading yellow on the next page. There we go. Okay, Article read four. Article 4 too. Article 4, Section 2. The citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states. Okay. All right, do Article 5. <laughs> Article 5. The Congress whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution or on the application of the legislators of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments, which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution, when ratified by the legislators of three-fourths of the several states or by conventions and three-fourths thereof. Okay. Why don't you just finish the second? Article 7. 17 day, 17th day of September in the year of our Lord, 1,787. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Right. Now that we've finished the articles of the Constitution, we're going to get to the first ten amendments which are known as the Bill of Rights and then under the 14th amendment the courts have taken the principles and values in the first ten amendments which were applicable to the federal government and they applied it to the state and that's called the doctrine of incorporation incorporating that which is applicable to prohibiting the federal government from doing the state and local governments do the same thing. Uh, we're going to have Reverend Billy, uh, who he's now going to cite the 45 words of the First Amendment, which is really five amendments. But I also want to, as his lawyer, uh, <laughs> let you know that what he's about to do a year ago, he was arrested for doing it. And he didn't have an amplified sound there. Uh, we were able to defend him and get the charges dismissed. And about 10 days ago, uh, Earl Ward and myself, uh, the grannies know who Earl Ward is, my co-counsel on many things, 
we went into the United States District Court, Southern District, which is in Manhattan, on behalf of Reverend Billy to sue the city of New York for violating his First Amendment rights. And the Reverend Billy, the person who he is, has said that at least some of whatever money we get, he's going to put and create a First Amendment defense fund so that other people who engage in First Amendment activities and are illegally arrested will at least have some opportunity to get Amen. counsel so that people can continue to speak up. Uh, I know a lot of people see Reverend Billy, street performer, and sometimes people, especially in the liberal left community, sort of poo-poo that. Uh, it has been a pleasure getting to know the Reverend Billy, and uh, he's serious about this stuff, folks. So a great privilege to introduce the Reverend Billy. Hallelujah. On the other side. Amen. Praise be. There you go. Somebody give me a bill of rights. Hallelujah! Here today. We've been recently trying to keep. You want that? The. Um, thank you so much. Been trying to keep the. 30 story high luxury condos out of Coney Island. That's right. That's right. And keep the privatizing business improvement district out of our beloved center of free speech, the pavilion on the north side of Union Square. <laughs> and whatever, whatever we take up, we always ask ourselves, will this development that they're proposing, will it reduce our ability to access and exercise the five freedoms that these 45 words defend? We're, we've, become, <laughs> we've become fundamentalists against fundamentalism. <laughs> We call ourselves the freedom cult. <laughs> we have zero tolerance for only one thing, and that's zero tolerance, amen. <laughs> so our Bible in the freedom cult has exactly 45 words. <laughs> Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or bridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Amen. Yeah. Bill of Rights, hallelujah. Yeah. And I'd like to thank my teacher, no, no. Norman. No. <laughs> no, no, uh, hallelujah. <laughs> And I would like to thank Savitri D, the recently the Queen Mermaid and the Mermaid Parade, and the First Amendment Gospel Choir. And I'd like to ask our Queen Diva, Sister Laura Newman, to sing this amendment for us. Amen. Praise be. You got the and thing right there. People should join in. People should join Hallelujah. in. Hallelujah. Join in if you want. And, and, you know, maybe someday kids can be this instead of the Pledge of Allegiance. Woo! That's right. <laughs> Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or yeah. prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech. Amen. Free speech, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or abridging the freedom of press. Free press. <laughs> For the right of the people, peacefully to assemble, petition this government for redress of grievances. Free speech. Free Let's start speech. from the top. Ready? Hallelujah. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the.
the freedom of speech. Yeah. For abridging the freedom of press. For the right of the people peacefully to assemble. Petition the government for redress of grievances. Second Amendment, as I said before, the Second Amendment, most of it, there was a decision in 1939, United States versus Miller, where the Supreme Court of the United States said the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms was in regard to the state militia. Hey, hey, you give me my but, speech. But now, <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'll be quiet. <laughs> Isn't he great? I mean, there's, there's nobody greater, except maybe his wife. <laughs> We're super great. One of the things I am obsessed about is guns in the hands of people. <laughs> I am obsessed about guns. They are in hands of people who don't qualify. The Supreme Court just ruled that in Washington, D.C., the highest instance of, of murder by guns is no longer legal. They did not read the Second Amendment. Now it goes further than this, so please bear with me. Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now which is more important? <laughs> Militia, security, the Then let's go back to Article 8, in which it says, to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. To provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia and for government such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States, reserving to the states respectfully the appointment of the officers and the authority of training the militia according to the discipline prescribed by Congress. Since when does this say that you can have a gun? It doesn't. So where are we gonna get a de decent Supreme Court? Thank you for listening. Please repeat this to everybody who says, I believe in guns. I believe in the Constitution. Thank you. Again, the Second Amendment case, which came out of the District of Columbia, was five to four. No, 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 no. With the conservative bloc. So at a minimum, the election in November of 2008 is crucial. At a minimum, just for the United States Supreme Court, Excuse me? Obama agreed with them. Well, he did. That's right. it's still, I'm talking about the importance of the Supreme Court of the United States because there are many, many more issues that are coming to that court and it's important to make sure that that court preserves the very principles and values we're talking about. All right, I need someone for the Third Amendment. I'd like just a comment oh, on, sure. on the second. Introduce yourself. I need someone to hold this for me because I got to do it. Hi, I'm... Uh, hi, I'm Steve Siegelbaum. Uh, just a comment on the Second Amendment. I believe that the, the guys who wrote that Bill of Rights were pretty intelligent people. Uh, we may agree or disagree on certain things, but I think they were pretty intelligent people. And I think there was a specific reason why they did not include this business about the right of the people to keep and bear arms why they didn't include it in that First Amendment. We heard Reverend Billy so eloquently 
uh, read that First Amendment. And those rights, those five rights in the First Amendment, there are no conditions placed on them. Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of religion, speech, press, people, people uh, to peaceably assemble, to redress of grievances. No conditions. It was later on that certain sensible conditions were placed by the courts. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater and that sort of thing. But in the Second Amendment, they, they used a separate amendment for this business about keeping and bearing arms. And it begins with a restriction that keeps it different from those other rights. The gun lobby, the wealthy, high-financed gun lobby will tell you that the right to bear arms is an absolute. But the Constitution says it's not. It depends on that first part, the first part of that one-sentence Second Amendment a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of the state. You know, in those days, they didn't have police forces. New York City didn't have a police force at all until well into the 19th century. There's another point. There's another point. They had, they had to have posses, but the posses had to be sworn in. But they were just regular guys uh, who were not militia, but they were finally sworn in to be a posse. Also, because of this decision in uh, the Supreme Court, uh, there were challenges the day thereafter to the San Francisco and Chicago uh, gun laws, and I've read in the paper that there will be a challenge to the New York City gun laws in the near future. So this is an issue probably for the next five to ten years that's going to be high up on that not only the legal agenda, but also policy issues. And I think it's a very crucial issue. All right, I need someone for the Fourth okay. Amendment. Aaron, you all know Aaron is the pie man, but he's been retired for a while, but we got him back. I have not retired because I am, because on, because on the internet there are people in training to carry on the job of taking care of business in the name of civic improvement. Before I begin, what do you all want? Peace. Peace. Peace, Peace and justice. Yeah. Yes. Justice. Equal justice. Equal justice. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against reasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath <clears throat> or affirmation, and particularly describing the plates to be searched, person or things to be seized. Okay. Are, any, are any of the people from Rebel Diaz here? Okay, they're not here. All right, that was a group that the Fourth Amendment was very applicable to. All right, now, uh, where's Bill? Bill, I want Bill Perkins, are you still here? Or habeas corpus. Bill Perkins. Hey, Arthur. He's on TV, okay. Uh, who wants to then read the Fifth Amendment? Well, I got it in front of me. Well, I want to get other people. Don't blame me. Okay, Arthur, come on up. And this is Arthur Schwartz, state committeeman from Lower Manhattan and a labor lawyer. I'll read the... Fifth Amendment. Yeah. No, pers no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment of an indictment of a grand jury except, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger. Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor to be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use 
without just compensation. Oh my goodness. <laughs> We're in so, ma so much trouble on this one. Yeah. Want to comment on some of I want to comment just on one piece of this, and I'm sure other people will have lots to say because this, this, is the, this amendment is chock full of those rights that we really need to be able to do all the other things that the Constitution allows us to do. But one area, I, I happen to be a, a union lawyer um, who repre who's represented hundreds and hundreds of people who have been fired from their jobs, private sector employees and public employees, and who represented the Transport Workers Union during the last strike. And one of the, th it's very clear when you represent people who work in government jobs um, that their right to be free from loss of that job without due process continues to erode and erode and erode and erode and erode. I, we have uh, one retired postal worker standing here who can, I'm sure can give witness to many, many, many people who lost their jobs without really having the ability to contest it. And this is one area that we really need to focus on in years to come. There are millions and millions of people who work for this federal government and state governments and municipal governments and authorities and institutions like that who very easily can lose their jobs and don't, even if they have unions often, don't have any right to redress. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a serious problem. It goes along with the free speech pro issue for public employees who under the current Supreme Court have had less and less and less and less of a right to speak out when they're on the job or even off the job. And it's an area that we have to think really long and hard about uh, when we vote this November. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill, still, Bill, are you still, is Bill Perkins still here or is he doing the TV interview? Bill, Bill, we want to talk about eminent domain. There's three areas of the city, Atlantic Yards in Brooklyn, Willits Point in Queens, and Upper West Side, Columbia. And Bill's been terrific on this issue. Let's see. Here's the amendment right here. First, let me uh, once again uh, underscore uh, how important what we're doing is today. You know, it's a great day for barbecue. It's a great day for a Frankfurter contest on Coney Island. It's not as good a day for the beach, but it's nevertheless a good day even for the beach. But it's even a better day for the Constitution. It's even a better day for us to reaffirm and renew our commitment and our understanding of the relevancy to our daily lives that the Constitution has. And, you know, it was earlier pointed out that this is, 08 is going to be a very, very important uh, year on a national scene, but it's also going to be very, very important more locally in terms of state government. Not being partisan, but as you know, there are many changes going on in New York state government faster than you, than you can blink. Things are changing. Uh, and uh, amongst the changes that I'm looking forward to is when uh, I and my colleagues in the Democratic Senate minority uh, become in the majority as a result of the 08 elections in November. And, and it's not important simply because I'll become the chairman of, of a committee or we'll be able to have a, a, a larger personal budget, so to speak, but more importantly because of how we may be able to move an agenda that is really relevant to those of us that live in this city, uh, whether it be with regard to housing and the, and the ability for us to uh, control housing opportunities in our community, but even more importantly as we talk about the Constitution as it relates to eminent domain. Eminent domain is a very burning issue, uh, not only in my district where Columbia University has been uh, trying to take over property from others who may not want their property taken over, right. just because Columbia wants to expand its territorial domain uh, beyond what even the community would want. So unfortunately, uh, when we see eminent domain being used. It is used in such a way that the big guy I don't know, you see what I'm saying? It's, a, it's this alarming issue here. <laughs> it's an alarming issue. And, and, uh, it, and so what happens is 
that, uh, as we have seen it too often used, it's like the big guy taking over something from the little guy. And it's usually uh, governmental influence that allows it to happen. So we're challenging that, not only in terms of a community movement, but also now we will be challenging in terms of state government, which has been authorized too often the use of eminent domain to take over people's property uh, without really due process, uh, without any real hearings or any real opportunity for the other side to be heard. Eminent domain is never when the bodega takes over the supermarket. It's always when the supermarket takes over the bodega, when the big guy takes over the little guy. And couldn't, wouldn't it make a lot of sense for us to use eminent domain to create affordable housing on the, ca <laughs> on the campus of Columbia University? It's <laughs> As opposed to Columbia University using eminent domain to take over our housing to build another extension to their campus. So we really want to flip the script and begin to be able to look at these inequalities and these injustices that the Constitution allows us to look at and even to correct. So I'm happy to be here again uh, to uh, read this Constitution with you, uh, to come to a better understanding of it with you, and to reaffirm our commitment to it in terms of it being a living guide for how we should run our government and how we should become better citizens. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. Uh, we're now going to have Kenny Schaefer read both the Sixth and the Eighth Amendment. Kenny is a legal aid lawyer who's been doing this for many, many years. He's also a housing activist. Okay, one more thing about the Fifth. Okay, Joe. Oh. Joel Kupferman, I usually wear the green hat Woo! out there from the Mass Defense Committee to make sure that you people can assemble in, in places like this. But I want to, now I'm wearing my, we the other hat, it. the other hat, right on that mic. Um, with, the, with the Environmental Justice Committee from the National Lawyers Guild. And we use the Fifth uh -huh. Amendment to go after someone named Chrissy Todd Whitman uh -huh. in a case called Benzman versus Whitman. We said, um, on behalf of the residents and the workers of Lower Manhattan, that we have a right to bodily integrity. We claimed that Chrissy Todd Whitman, by saying that the air was safe, violated that right and drew people back into the zone of danger. Right. The district court, Judge Batt said, we agree with you that her behavior was egregious. Unfortunately, it went up to the Second Circuit and they disagreed with Judge Batts and said that Chrissy Todd Whitman has qualified immunity. She had the right to tell us the lies that she told us, one, because there was competing um, government policy, and that was to get Wall Street up and going, and also she took orders from the White House. So just remember the Fifth Amendment is one of the best in that it covers everything, including our right to bodily integrity and our right to breathe clean air. Thank you. And thank you for all your good work. Now, Kenny Schaefer. Hi, uh, I'm really happy to be able to be here today and join with Norman and Bill and the grannies and everyone else here uh, and read the uh, Bill of Rights and the Constitution. Because if Attorney General Dick Thornburg had got his way, the only right we would have had left would be the right to remain silent. And the government would be allowed to torture us until we gave that up voluntarily. So the Sixth Amendment says, the Sixth Amendment says that in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process. I don't know if this reaches down to Guantanamo, but uh, they should be listening. To have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. And the Eighth Amendment says, excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Now, on the issue of right to counsel, of course, this applies uh, to criminal cases. Uh, in the housing field, one thing we're trying to establish is right to counsel in eviction cases. And there's a wide range of groups that are behind this. It's partly a, f a financing issue, although it saves affordable housing because more than, all, more than half of all low-income seniors live in rent-regulated apartments. And given the, the weakened status of the rent protection laws, whenever, whenever people are put out of their homes, those homes are permanently lost as affordable housing, which costs hundreds of thousands of dollars per unit to replace. 
So we need to get right to council across the board. Thank you. Also, just to comment on the Eighth Amendment, the cruel and unusual punishment, many of us believe that capital punishment, the death penalty, is cruel and unusual punishment. Right. And it's not a penalty. The Supreme Court this term had two decisions regarding the death penalty. One out of Kentucky, where there was a challenge to the lethal injection process by arguing that it was cruel and unusual punishment. The Supreme Court, seven to two, said no. The only silver lining in that case was the court said that the facts were not able to demonstrate that it was cruel and unusual punishment. So it keeps the argument that if you have facts in a given state, perhaps in Florida where they've botched many of the uh, lethal injections, this case could come back. On the second case, five to four, it was whether or not the death penalty should be applied when someone rapes a child. And the court said five to four, even though that's one of the most horrific crimes that our Constitution says that the death penalty will only apply when the person dies. And therefore, it was not applicable. It was a case out of Louisiana, and there were six states around the country that applied the death penalty for someone who raped a child. So that's the update. And the capital punishment cases continue each term to come to the Supreme Court. And again, why, when it's 4-4 with Kennedy being the swing, you never know, and I don't think you can give all these issues up to one person on the court. So, very important. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments are known as the Civil Rights Amendments. They came out as a result of the Civil War. Do I have someone who wants to come up and read 13, 14, and 15? Can I do nine? No, we're not doing nine. Jenny? Hey. Introduce yourself and do. Don't keep walking to your right. Get Just hold down the button. I'll hold it for you. My name is Jenny Hines. My name is Jenny Hines. My name is Jenny Hines. Section 1. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. 14th Amendment. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. And finally, the 15th. 15th Amendment, Section 1, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. I kneel at your feet. Got a question on the death penalty. Save your questions till the end. Might be answered. Mm -hmm. Well, I know the answer. Yeah. I just want to validate it. Validate it. Validate it. On the Fourteenth Amendment, uh, a couple of things. First, on voting rights. Uh, first, on voting rights. There was a case this term out of Indianapolis, in Indiana, with regard to voting, and the Supreme Court upheld the requirement that when people have to vote, they have to come in with a government-issued photo ID. The argument was made that that will deprive poor people, people of color, seniors, the right to vote. And the court dismissed that argument. And we have to be on guard because other states potentially will try to do that, and that will 
set us back many, many years on the issue of the right to vote. Also, with regard, is David Miller here? Okay, he's not here. Uh, David Miller is uh, a uh, AIDS organizer, and uh, the point that I made earlier about life, uh, the city budget this year uh, reduced HIV AIDS programs by six million dollars. I just want to just read a few. The HIV AIDS counseling eliminated. The HIV AIDS outreach enhancement eliminated. Housing for homeless persons living with HIV eliminated. Hepatitis C public education campaign eliminated. The injection drug user health alliance reduced by $700,000 and the rapid HIV testing reduced by one million dollars. Shame, 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 exactly. shame. And this is uh, municipal budget decisions that basically create a huge crisis for the hundreds of thousands of people in the city who are HIV AIDS infected. So we need to be aware that some of these provisions do have life and death possibilities for people. All right, I need someone to go on to read the 18th Amendment. This is the only couple we have now. All right, you want to give it the 18th, bigger? Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. This part? Yeah. My name is Dari Jacobs. I'm vice president of the, I'm sorry. My name is Dari Jacobs. I'm vice president of the Park West Village Tenants Association. We are very beleaguered by development and I have a very serious illness at the result of living right on the edge of a construction pit. So affordable housing and quality of life and health issues are very important to me. I also wanted to say that in the Republican National Convention, it must have been 04 the actors read the Bill of Rights at Cooper Union and I was there and it was amazing and unfortunately we still need this. Amendment uh, seven, uh, 18 section 1. Can you hear me? No. After one year from the ratification of this article the manufacturer sale or transportation of intoxicating liquors within the importation thereof into or the exportation thereof from the United States and she can't go closer she can't go any closer and all territory subject to the jurisdiction thereof for beverage for beverage purposes is hereby prohibited right. just to, just to jump it out of uh, sync so those of us who are concerned about drinking later today uh, read the uh, 21st so that people won't get too nervous. Yeah, this, this is not as, as fitting for me, unfortunately. Uh, section, this is our Amendment 21, Section 1, the 18th Article of Amendment to the Constitution of the United States is hereby repealed. And to get a quick pun in, let's toast that one. Uh, very important amendment, the 19th Amendment. Molly, you want to come up and read the 19th Amendment? Yes, come on. I think it would be fitting for you to read this one. If I can see it. Oh. My, my print is bigger. So All right. Turn to the side. I'll give you another one. You want me to read it? Help you read it? The terms of the president. Wait, 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 wait. No, we got, a, we got a bigger, bigger type. Yeah. Someone else should read this. <laughs> I'm legally blind. Okay. Which means you want, want to follow for me? See, but the right of the citizens. <laughs> the right of the citizens. The right of the citizens. <laughs> no, I didn't mean to. To vote shall be not denied. The to, right of the citizens to vote shall not be denied or abridged or abridged by the United States by the United States or any would please be patient or by any state 
or by any state. On account of sex. On account of sex. Woo! All right. <laughs> Thank you. Woo! And again, it's unbelievable. It took until 1920 before this country recognized that just looking at this crowd, more than half of the people here had the right to vote. On, you know, believable. <laughs> All right, hold on. Let me get to. We're almost done. All right, we need someone to read the 26th and the 27th Amendment. Who's our youngest person here? The youngest person? The 26th? Here we go, here we go. All right, I'm not that young. <laughs> it's all relative. We'll take it. 26 and 27. And your name? My name is Savitri. Yes. Amendment 26, Section 1. The right of citizens of the United States who are 18 years of age or older to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of age. Yes. Amendment 27. So everybody here can vote now. <laughs> no law varying the compensation for the services of the senators and representatives shall take effect until an election of representatives shall have intervened. Okay, okay thank you. Okay. All right, so there's 27 amendments to the Constitution, the 26th, about 18 years, 1971, and the 27th, 1992. So we've gone almost 20 years without any further amendment. That concludes our reading. 27 is with regard to compensation for both the senators and the representatives uh, shall take effect until an election of the representatives shall intervene. So that means that the senators and the House of Representatives can't increase their own salary. That would be applicable for that point. But since incumbency is 97.6%, it, it, in effect, is, it, they still get it. Uh, we now have concluded reading the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Seven Articles, and the amendments to the Constitution, not just the first 10, but touching upon many of the 27 amendments. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed the day, that you think and are reflective of a reflective of uh, additional concerns that you've heard today and that we make these documents alive uh, as a result of the principles and values that are in it. And looking around this crowd, this is a crowd of activists, it's a crowd of people who are compassionate about these principles and values. And remember, stamina, stamina, you just have to outlast the you know what and in the context of that uh, as Martin King always said we shall overcome so keep the faith uh, we hope that you'll be back here next year July 4th 2009 and every July 4th thereafter and for those of you who are not from the New York City area replicate this in your communities uh, the 4th of July is red white and blue that is us, and don't let anyone ever take that away from us. And as the t-shirts say, we will not be silent. We have not only a First Amendment right, but under the Declaration of Independence, if you listen to the words carefully, we have an obligation to speak up. And when people in government, no matter who they are, Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservative, when they are not respecting and protecting our rights under these treasures, the Declaration, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights and the other amendments. We the people, we the people have the right and the obligation to speak up because this is our country. That's right. And That's right. in order for it to be our country, we have to be involved and we can't let other people make the decisions for us. 
So there are very serious and substantial questions that are out there, questions that are percolating out there and that will come to be. And we need an active citizenry. We need people who are meddlesome in city, state, and national government so that we don't let them do what they do in our name. Anyway, happy 4th of July. Happy Independence. Thank you. Yeah. I don't want that. Oh, you take. I want. I want the one seventeen here. We need you back because our leaders, our leaders, and you're making the world great.